Don't start yelling before you know if the mic's on or not. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I, I, I thought about the spotlight a little bit when they told me it was going to happen, and uh, I went through my list of, of moderators, and there are many that are doing great jobs here, but, but I just thought, I, I want to know what the fans think, the administrators think, the, the coaches think, and one of the reasons I, I'm, I'm running for president, and I think one of the reasons we're at this inflection point, is the membership, the, the people that, that grow this game, the people that love this game, the people that have done it, and, and I'm fortunate that I've gone through absolutely every level, and um, I, 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 I've been touched to see that those relationships still exist. And my last memory of the game is a, is a professional one, and I had a career-ending injury in 2008, and I had a national team perspective. I had a professional environment perspective. And when, when I had my injury, I left the game. I, I left the game completely. And I was so devastated because I felt I was, I was pushing this boulder up the hill and, and, and was so excited about the opportunity to represent my country and, and, and fulfill my goal. And my ultimate goal was to play in a World Cup one day. And um, to be able to play the game for a living I, I can't tell you what that felt like, but to have it taken away through injury, I thought to myself, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm not a soccer player anymore, and, and what do I do now? And so the first couple of years, um, when I stopped playing soccer, I, I went and worked in finance, and um, that was in end of 2007, beginning of 2008. I did not cause the financial crash, um, but I was, I was there to see just a, a, an inflection point. I, I, I saw a, an industry that had grown complacent. I, I saw an industry that didn't read the signs. I saw an industry full of competitive people that had a profit motive, and, and, and they, they, they missed something. And obviously there are some parallels and there are others that are complete false equivalencies, but it was, it was just interesting. I realized in that moment, um, when I was in Manhattan with a buddy that I played college soccer with, uh, this, this isn't the world for me. I, I'm interested in this, but what am I, what am I running away from? And I realized I, I, I was running away because I, I had fallen out of love with soccer, and soccer was everything in my life. I mean, it, it was from the moment I could walk, the only thing I ever wanted to do was play this game. And whether I did it for a living or I played it for the rest of my life, it was always going to be something central to me. It was going, it was going to ground me. It was going to take me forward. And, and, and losing that was, was such a tough moment in my life. And, and it was, a, it was a, a conversation at a bar at the White Horse Tavern and, and the West Village in Manhattan where a buddy of mine said, we need an extra guy for the game tonight. I said, it's 11.30. I said, well, yeah, the game doesn't start till 12. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this is wild. I haven't played in so long. I, I just, I, I honestly got nervous. I mean, I've, I've played in, in stadiums in front of big crowds all around the world, and I'm nervous to go play at Pier 40 uh, with a bunch of adults. And, and then I realized the nerves um, were excitement, that, that there, there were, it was an olive branch. There was a way to get back into the game. And, and from that day, I've been a soccer player again, and I began to fall in love again with a game that meant so much to me my entire life. And that led me into a television career I'm so lucky to have, and to be sitting in a studio with people I love to work with, covering a game that I grew up on, and to know that there are kids out there sitting, and the best compliment I, I ever get is from, from parents that say, we sit every weekend as a family and, and we watch you guys on TV. And I thought to myself, I was a little kid scrambling, and this is kind of like the, you know, up the hill both ways in the snow story, but turning the dial, looking for something on a Sunday morning as my parents are trying to round up my terrible brothers and my sister to get us all dressed in terrible Argyle sweaters to go to church. I'm, I'm just searching for this game that I would find every now and then. And to think from that, from desperately trying to find a game in another language on the TV and, and just hoping that I accidentally stumbled across it to these kids that on their phones, on their tablets, have the Bundesliga, the Premier League, Major League Soccer, uh, La Liga. It's just, it, it's remarkable to think how far this game has come. Um, 
but, but when we failed to qualify for the World Cup, um, I, I got another one of those, 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 those awful feelings. Um, and this time, it was that I'd found my place, I'd found my way back to the game, but, but I, I had noticed things, and, and, and it's the criticism I had of people in the finance industry, that there were things that didn't make sense, there were valuations that didn't seem right, there was market confusion, there were all these things that should have led people to say, well, hold on a second. And from my pulpit, with NBC, with Fox, with ESPN, I tried so hard to point to things to say, I feel, I feel we're slipping a little bit. I, I feel that we're not paying attention to what makes this game great, what, what, what truly builds a soccer culture in this country. And having the serendipity of growing up in Westport, Connecticut, it's kind of like Malcolm Gladwell's outliers. Sometimes you just gotta get really lucky. And I was just really lucky my dad's job took me to a place where soccer was so important. And, and, I, and I have some of my youth coaches here today that I've been in touch with for the entire ride even during the tough parts where, where I, I didn't want to be around the game anymore. And, and I have my uh, coach, Mick Kites, when I was young, bringing one of the beachside teams here on Saturday, a team that I get to go and train with. And he says, you know, are you sure you want to play with kids? They're going to run around you and, uh, and make you look bad. And um, that's why I love him is, is he makes sure that I stay humble. And uh, I, I just, I realize this is the moment failing to qualify for World Cup, I mean, that happens. And that's why I brought Thierry Henry to come do the presentation this morning because uh, they, they know what this feels like. They failed to qualify in 90 and 94 and then won the World Cup in 1998. Did they figure out every problem they had in four years and went from a team that can't qualify to a team that can win a World Cup? No, no. Failing to qualify for World Cup is, is a symptom of, of systemic issues. Systemic issues that... Um, can metastasize and create catastrophic moments like the one that the men just went through, moments that we all feel, moments that break our hearts because we want to celebrate our team at a World Cup. But you very quickly have to move past the hysteria and understand this is an incredible opportunity, an incredible opportunity to, to change in the right ways, to, to, to turn the Federation back into a member services organization that knows their membership that, that goes out and meets them, that, that understands what they need in California, in Connecticut, in Washington, in Texas. Everyone needs something different, but everyone locally, they're all working so hard to grow this game and they believe in it. Some are volunteers, some have made it their profession, but all of them are in it because they believe that one day this will be the preeminent sport in this country. And I, I never dreamed to in my dreams and aspirations as a kid in my backyard in Westport, Connecticut, you know, doing the commentary for my own World Cup winning goal. I never dreamed of one day being U.S. soccer president. I, I just dreamed that other kids would have the opportunities I had, that I was fortunate to have, that, um, that, that, that fans of sport would be fans of this game like I was, that it would be treated the way it's treated around the world. And, and when we failed to qualify for the World Cup and I didn't see accountability I didn't see humility. I didn't see us raise our hands and say, you know what, we did this. Yeah, bad bounces happen, bad coaches happen. Th those, th that's not the issue. W when I didn't see anyone stand up and say, uh, we deserve better. Have we done great things? Of course we've done great things. Have we grown this game? Of course we have. There is an inertia about this sport. It's the number one sport in the world that, we, that we've been the beneficiaries of, and, and it's been remarkable to, to, to watch that grow. And there are many people in this room, and I think this convention perfectly encapsulates what I'm talking about. It's emblematic of the people that have been there on the ground growing this thing. And, and if you grab every national team player, they will come back here and have an emotional moment with, with two or three coaches. We, we don't get to where we get without you, but I'm not really worried about that. I'm worried about the kids that never even get into the game. I'm worried about the kids that get into the game and 50% of them are gone before the age of 10. So w what I wanna do today is obviously talk about my progress plan that's, that's being passed out to, to answer tough questions, to, to drill down to substantive ideas um, because right now we have to be okay disagreeing again. We, we really have to sit here and understand that this is an incredible opportunity to elect change. 
elect change that will, that will integrate what's amazing about our game in this room and at this convention this weekend are people from all over the state that make up 55 associations or organizations or, or, or technology or education or health or wellness. Th this is so much bigger than a World Cup. And, and I, I know that sounds ridiculous. World Cup's the biggest sporting event on the planet. But you win World Cups by, by empowering and uniting people like yourselves, the people that come to this convention every single year to trade ideas, best practices, to trade old stories, to, to sit there and celebrate a game that's not going anywhere, but a game that could go a lot further if we, if we elect a leader that's going to stand in front of the membership and say, I've got you, I, I understand now. And we need someone with the wisdom to find the right people smarter people than they are to, to help make these decisions, the courage to tackle problems that are gonna be difficult, problems that will make you unpopular, problems that uh, are, are, there's no panacea for, but most importantly, the humility to say, I'm not the expert in all of these categories. I'm just someone that loves this game so much. I'm someone that is so grateful for what the game's given me, and now it's time to do something and give something back to the game. Um, I thought I was doing that as an educator on, on TV. It, 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 it was where I fit in, it was, it was a profession I loved. Um, it's a profession maybe I, I go back to at some point. But, but right now what's needed is, and I give credit to all the candidates who have stepped forward, um, we, we need courage. And we need courage to, to stand in front of the membership and say, I'm sorry, but things are gonna change. But most importantly, things can only change if we finally come to you and we listen. So I've spent the last few months on the phone speaking with associations and stakeholders and people who, who, who make this thing run and just asked questions for the first few months so that I could speak all of the languages and I could put a group of, of people together, a diverse group in Manhattan in a boardroom for two days to begin this progress plan that you have in your hands. A and what we came out of that room with is a skeleton plan that needed to be fleshed out and how I fleshed it out was flying all over the country and, and cashing in chits, chits that I've worked on my entire life, which are relationships that are solely based on the love of a game. And because I never had any agenda, be, be, because I didn't need this network to accomplish anything, I only used this network uh, like a book club to just, to just share and, and the joy and the, and, and the frustrations that come with a very competitive game, a game that has ebbs and flows, especially the higher up the pyramid you get, but, but we're not mitigating risk and, and, and including enough people because we have professionalized this game in a way that, that, is, that is, I think, starving it of what fuels a soccer culture and is just the joy and passion that playing a game that only takes you and a ball, and I spent the majority of my youth doing that in my basement duct taping a square and, and just becoming obsessed with the idea of if I can just master this ball, just think where it could take me. And, and it's taken me all over the world. It's introduced me to incredible people. Many are here in this room or, or, or at the convention tonight. Um, and now it's taken me into an election where I'm standing in front of you and saying, T tell me what type of leader you need. And I've been doing that for two months and I think I have a good idea. Um, but I wanna continue that question tonight and open up the forum we have, um, is, this, is this the mic right here? Am I supposed to kick it to someone or? Okay, so can I pass, can I pass it to you? Do you oh. So I, I'm pretty sure this is a mic and I'd love to just, if you wanna raise your hand and instead of sitting with a moderator, I want, I want you guys to lead this discussion and tell me what's important to you and what you'd like to know from me. Hi, Kyle, how's it going? Uh, Chris Kibblehan, Midfield Press. Um, question for you, there are hundreds of people right now um, working for whether they're players, staff, um, teams in the NASL um, who have found themselves outside the system. Um, you know, and there are plenty of fans who want to you know, buy season tickets and support their club. How would you, how would you work with the current conflict and bring, bring those, those clubs and that league back into the system? Yeah, good question, thank you. Um, uh, this is one of those areas where I, I know enough about the lawsuit to be dangerous, but I think it's irresponsible to comment on specifics without really knowing 
what's going on, but I know that ha having a professional league suing I its, its, its federation or another professional league is not a good thing. Um, w we, we don't want litigation between members. And um, if we're talking about inclusion, if we're talking about a, a merit-based system and getting more kids in, more players in at the professional level, more fans in at the local level, um, closing the doors to an entire professional league is not the way to do it. And um, I, I, I've gotten the opportunity to speak with all of the members involved from Major League Soccer. Um, I've spoken to NASL owners. I, I, I got a chance down in Florida to meet with Ricardo Silva. Uh, I've met recently with, um, on the phone, not in person, with Rocco, um, with the Cosmos. and. I understand their frustration. Th these are very passionate, and as an Italian-American myself, I'll say sometimes overly passionate people um, th that just love this game and came to help grow it. And uh, w whether they were sold an idea that didn't come to fruition or, or whether they don't feel they're being given the opportunities, these are men that have invested millions and millions of dollars and have been told that they can't play anymore. Um, and, and what bothers me, of course, as a former player, is what happens to these players? I mean, these, these players that have careers, that have made sacrifices, that have trained, that have given their life to something that finally came to fruition. And I can't tell you the incredible joy of signing your perf first professional contract. It's something you remember for the rest of your life. And, and the idea that these players have been told, no practice tomorrow because you, you're not in a league anymore, um, it, it, it's, it's it's heartbreaking because at a moment where we're talking about a World Cup failure and trying to do the autopsy to figure out how something like that happens, um, getting rid of one of the, the vehicles that develops and delivers players that are prepared for that challenge, um, it, it's counterintuitive. And um, promotion relegation has become a, a buzzword. and and. What's troubling is that there is a very strong, compelling argument for creating a meritocracy and opening up a system that will, that will allow for investment, will allow for, for, for architecture and infrastructure, will allow for local academies that will increase opportunities. Um, the argument has been made in, in, in a pretty rabid way by a select few that I think create a noise that, that, that isn't beneficial to what should be a very good discussion to figure out how do we, instead of closing an entire professional league out, help them to grow, help, help, help their owners to see that investment leads to opportunity? And so opening up a system is, is a great way to do that. Now, does it have its challenges based on historical precedent of the NSL failing at one point based off of a certain business model? Absolutely. Um, are, are certain owners in and investing millions of money and, and losing millions of money, millions of, of dollars because they, they bought into a downside protection of a single entity? Yes, of course. And, and all of these create challenges, but, but uh, do not make this impossible to make sure that the NASL could be a thriving league. Now, do they, do they have their challenges that they accept? And I've gotten an opportunity to speak with the Commissioner Rishi. Um, they, they, they take accountability for the areas that they need to improve upon. But, but without what we see around the world, the, the opportunity to have one of the greatest sports stories of all time, Lester, 5,000 to one. And, and I was there in the studio covering that in the entire season. That, that transcended and crossed into mainstream. I mean, I had, I had uh, my, you know, my dentist asking me about this Lester team. Who's this guy, Jamie Vardy? A and so the underdog story that, that is a compelling uh, differentiation in a very crowded sports market that we're in is something that should be considered. And, and instead, of, instead of not being willing to come to the table to figure out if it's feasible and start there, is it feasible? Okay, if you think this can happen one day, now, now let's try to plan out when and how. And that, that, that's why I put it in my progress plan to say, I don't think the NASL lawsuit exists if, if there is a carrot that says one day your investment in coaching, your investment in facilities, your investment in players, your investment in academies could get you all the way up the pyramid. So I'm, I'm on the ownership group of Real Mallorca in Spain and um, obviously a dream to be able to buy into owning a team, especially such an incredible historic soccer team, a hundred year old club in, in, in Mallorca who, 
was at a bit of a fall from grace. And so I'm going through a rebuild right now in a soccer business to try to figure out budgeting and, and coaching and technical direction, even down to we knocked down the wall between the, the youth and the adults so that the young kids could see their, see their stars, see their heroes eating right in the cafeteria with them and say, I, I want to be that person. I'm going to be sitting in that chair soon. So um, we, we can't begin a lot of these conversations if, if, if the negotiating point is litigation. So um, again, I don't know enough to be able to comment on, on the facts, but, but I promise you a healthy NASL, a healthy USL, a healthy Major League Soccer, uh, use any acronym you want, but to, in order to grow into markets, um, expansion can't, can't, can't accomplish that. Uh, you know, we can't expand fast enough to, to cover every single market in this country. And there, there, are, there are aspects of that mechanism that actually dilute the product. So it concerns me, which kind of links us to US soccer, um, we, we have business people um, that aren't product experts and we need to combine the two of them. We, we need to have business people product experts, and hopefully we, we, we grow into a country that's full of business product experts where we can trust that there's a symbiotic relationship between what has to be a business, and sometimes decisions are made that, that go against the romanticism of the professional game, but, but you can't lose that romanticism. It's, it's what got us all involved in this game, it, it, growing up watching it. The Bridgeport Italians, I mean, that, you know, the Brooklyn Italians and Pan Cyprians, those were my professional teams when I was young. They didn't have to be in a major league, didn't have to be first division, Premier League. I just saw players that were playing a game for a living and I'd go hang out by their car afterwards when they were done playing and try to get autographs. You know, it doesn't take much to inspire a kid, um, but, but we have to make sure that opportunity's there. And so the NASL gave opportunity to plenty of kids that maybe were the late bloomers or hadn't been identified yet. And, and uh, Hercules Gomez, I was talking to him the other day. I mean, his path to the national team is, is a fascinating one where he had to make a bunch of sacrifices and his family did as well. He bounced around, went to Mexico, tried to find a team, ended up in PDL and other things and ended up being a US national team player and, and, and scoring a bunch of great goals, being a part of these huge tournaments. Um, there, are, there are these incredible stories, but those stories are a dime a dozen. We have more of these stories if we have several avenues, several professional leagues that are, are a, a, a meritocracy based on perform, play, and, and, and climb. I mean, that, that's how it's done around the world. And so, I think sometimes we try to Americanize the game too much, and then sometimes you know the irony is we try to be a Germany and we can't be. So uh, I think it's okay to admit where we can't go, but we have to understand that we're putting a lot of roadblocks in place and we're stymieing progress in a big way. So I, I think that's a really important thing to look at is to say, whoever the next president is, you, you have to value every single professional league. I mean, you, you can't prioritize one over any of the others. I mean, that, 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 that sort of uh, favoritism, it, it, it's going to, to lead to breaking down what solves the problem of having a country the size of Europe. You know, you know how you fix the disparity between the budget of a Premier League team and the budget of a Major League Soccer team or an NASL or USL? Affinity, right? If you can't spend $200 million on player salaries yet, which we can't, um, then, then the team you support has to mean something to you. You'll watch the team you support. I mean, I, one of my good buddies is a, is a Tranmere Rovers fan. I mean, he's not watching them because they're better than Manchester United. I promise you that. He's watching them because that's his team. And, and whether, you know, th these, these young boys and girls want to believe in something, and it's easy to believe in something that's right down the road. I had Giant Stadium right down the road. And to see a World Cup game there, I mean, uh, forever changed me as a kid. And to know in that area I had all these professional teams, I mean, that, that, was, that was affinity. So what do we do for the markets that don't have major league soccer teams? Well, we give them professional teams that they fall in love with. And so that, that needs to be a focus on, on how do we solve problems? Because there are problems and it's not gonna be an easy fix. But um, I, I, I don't think anyone would say being in litigation is good for any of us.
Hi, uh, Steffi Young from Stripe SC. So I'd like to ask you about NWSL. What do you think NWSL should look like five years from now? And what should U.S. soccer's relationship look like around that time to the league, do you think? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, NWSL, and there's been many iterations, um, the, the, the women's game, um, and, and, and Mia Hamm and Julie Foudy and some of these former players that were idols of mine that I'm fortunate I can call on for some advice right now have said a few things. One is, Kyle, we're really frustrated that our success keeps getting used to paper over cracks. And, and people point to World Cups we're winning or gold medals we're winning and saying, look, we're getting a lot of things right. Because if you look at the youth structure right now and, and some of the, the recent tournaments for the U.S. women, it seems that there's a, there's a, a talent drain coming where they're, they're not succeeding at the youth level like they used to. And we had a mechanism in Title IX to focus on the women's game before other countries. So because of our resources, because of our attention to women's sports before others, we became the Spain, the Germany, the Brazil of the women's game, and, and we're the vanguards, we're, we're, the, we're the pace setters. And other countries have invested in their professional leagues, have invested in many ways, and caught up and surpassed our women's team. So our professional league is, is crucial to the development of players, but also the carrot for young girls to say, I've got somewhere to go. I didn't have a professional league to play in when I was little to aspire to, I mean, that came in the mid 90s. And now all of a sudden, uh, th th there was, it became real, it was tangible. I, I knew that the, the, the top for me was not a good college career and then figure out what to do afterwards or hope I could make the enormous leap to getting over to Europe. We need, we need young girls out there to see their heroes, their stars playing in stadiums professionally uh, in their country domestically. So th the way that we've gone about it recently, and I give Dan Flynn and Sunil Gladi a lot of credit for putting focus on making sure you create a sustainable league through subsidizing some of the costs. So a lot of uh, NWSL teams, you look at some of them that are independent and have different challenges, and some of them that are affiliated with Major League Soccer where US national team players will have their salaries paid and cover the cost for some of these uh, professional leagues. Uh, for professional teams, but in, in, in order to, to grow, we need more teams. And, and you can't have a, a, a female player thinking that college is the end and retiring in their prime around you know, 22, 23. And how you do that is Heather Riley and some others that have had remarkable careers and found opportunities abroad, uh, Carly Lloyd, you say, we're gonna grow more opportunity here by creating some incentives. Major League Soccer had a similar problem. I mean, Major League Soccer in the middle of the 2000s was close to completely collapsing. And I give Don Garber and, and Sunil Gulati and, and others a lot of credit for coming up with Soccer United marketing. One aspect they did was they wanted the, the English broadcasting rights so that they get the World Cup in this country, but also created a, a leveraged package of you want U.S. soccer, you got to have MLS, you want MLS, you want to have U.S. soccer. There are ways that we can do that with NWSL, but also there are ways to create a, a model where, just like we asked a few owners back in the mid 2000s for MLS, just believe that we'll get over the hump. Just, just believe that investment now can lead to long-term gains and stability. And that's, that's given us a thriving uh, first division for for men's soccer, the same is true for the women's game, where if you link it to expansion, if right now coming into the professional league for major league soccer, one of the prerequisites is that you have to fund a, a women's league and have an affiliated women's league that you help subsidize. I mean, th that's one mechanism that can make the short-term losses more, you can mitigate that and make it more attractive for some owners to say, who want to, of course, grow grow the women's game here to say, okay, I, I, I see that mitigating my risk based on, on combining it with another franchise is a way to get over a hump where we finally can disconnect the federation from, you know, take that umbilical cord off and let our professional league thrive because our women are our world-class players. I mean, I always hear people say, man, when we finally win a World Cup, I mean, we, we are winning World Cups. We have world-class players. I mean, Mia Hamm's one of the best soccer players we've ever produced. I mean, imagine if, if we don't get a lot of the next Mia Hamm's, and that's happening right now, because getting to college is, is, is the end of the road. So um, it's absolutely important, and it's possible to be able to subsidize and, and, and protect short-term losses to create investment 
in, in the women's game that gives us a professional league that's going to be here to stay and going to grow in other markets. The dif differences between the league now and the league in five years that you think should happen? Well, I, I think for sure that you need to not be dependent on, on U.S. soccer funding salaries. We need the clubs to step up and pay soccer players to have a career and a career that's exclusively in, in our league growing into other markets. So we need twice as many teams as we have now. So, so for sure, the goal should be to double the markets. Um, I mean, the next goal is to try and figure out, and we're, we're early on this one with ECNL and the DA. We're not really sure since it's so new uh, wh where that's going to lead the development phase of the women's game. But the affiliation with Major League Soccer clubs and right up the road, uh, you know, NYCFC and other organizations have created a very low cost, high level of training for young players. It has to happen on the women's side too. And, and we're just not in enough markets. And so, of course, uh, expansion is something that needs to be done slowly, but the goal should be absolutely in five years to double the amount of teams that we have. Thank you. Any more questions? There's one right, right back here. I guess uh, talk a little bit about um, what your first six months on the job would look like. Uh, what are some, some immediate priorities that you see need to be addressed? So um, a lot of it I, I've already started. Um, my wife thinks I'm crazy, but I've quit my job already, and I'm doing this full time. So the, the progress plan was... Uh, I think other candidates have said, you know, the first 60 days they'll go around and do a tour and put together a plan. Um, I, I've been doing that for the last 60 days and I put together something that of course is imperfect and, and needs to be molded and we have to again be okay with, with discourse and discussion to, to use this as a jumping off point um, to, to really start to integrate and grow into what already exists and have the federation, instead of sometimes becoming a competitor in the market, uh, be the one who's going to plug everything in. And so I've been having meetings with uh, the youth, asso youth associations, I've been meeting with AYSO and US club soccer and youth soccer and say to help bring everyone back to the table, which I think out of everything is the most important. I mean, th there is no panacea, but we have to, of course, reestablish trust in the federation and, and, and get rid of this market confusion. I mean, the parents out there, they would do anything for their kids. And as a parent right now, I would do anything for my kid. And, uh, and now that I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, I'm already thinking to myself, man, if it costs five to $10,000 right now for them to get into some of these programs, I can't imagine what it's gonna cost when they're ready for it. Um, we, we create the buzzword of pay to play like it's some pantomime villain, forgetting the fact that that exists in every other sport, that exists in every other country. But um, what we have to do is we have to get into the marketplace and, and, and localize the game so that kids aren't flying all over this country. It's gonna help with lowering the cost. It's gonna help with making it easier to identify talent and, and create a pathway that's defined and then regulated. Now I know regulated is a nasty word and, and, and you can be using that in a pejorative way, but, but I just mean once you set the market conditions and once there are requirements, you have to, as a federation and as a leader of that federation, say, this is what we've agreed upon, this is how it's going to happen going forward, and then you create the mechanisms that exist all over the world, solidarity payments and reimbursements and grants, to, if kids want to, and it should be their choice where, what path they want to take, if they want to move up the pyramid, uh, we need to reward the coaches that have trained them. We need to reward the local communities that created a Kyle Martino or Benny Failheiber, both coming out of the same academy, so that we can help these clubs continue to, to grow these players. We can help them buy fields, lower costs of coaching education, and do all these things. But instead, we've created such an incredible competitive atmosphere where these parents just, just don't know one from the other. And what's happening is it, it's pricing kids out of even getting involved in the game, um, and it's stressing kids out of the game. So Mia Hamm was the one who said this to me. Kyle, this is great, all of the pathways and getting together with the organization so that we can understand that the associations are the ones that we really should be leaning on to help us solve these problems. Um, but, but first and foremost, you have to understand that there's an epidemic that a lot of these kids aren't having fun anymore. I mean, this is a World Cup winner who's coaching under 12 girls in California 
and she's doing it because she knows that's where she can be the most important right now. She loves the game and talks about the 99 World Cup team and says, Kyle, people forget, one of the reasons that 99 team was so good is we were goofy. We had fun. We joked with each other. You know, we didn't take ourselves too seriously, but when it came time to get together and play, we were unstoppable. Um, and, and she said, I'm worried that that spirit of, of what we had, it, it's getting lost as we're professionalizing the game too early and, and picking winners at a really young age. And so what I need to do, and I've been doing it already, is, is go to the biggest part of the membership where kids come into this game and, and return the, the fun and the joy of why I got involved in my smile campaign and, and over under that I have my progress plan are low cost, high impact ways to, to grow f infrastructure, to build facilities, to create educational programs, to make it fun again. And, and, and then, if there's a pyramid, if there's a pathway, the kids that will make it will go up, but, but it can't be, I either make it to the next level, and if I don't, that's it. We lose kids that never come back. They never come back as, as, as administrators, as coaches, as refs, as fans. And, and, and to grow a soccer culture, you need a president that's not trying to trickle down economics by spending money all the way up on the top of the pyramid. I mean, we're spending $3 million a year still. $3 million a year on a coach that we decided wasn't performing. We spent that same amount of money over 10 years on financial aid. So, so grassroots has not been important enough. Uh, uh, there's a diversity task force that if you click on the website of US Soccer leads you to a blank page. Why? Because nine months ago it disbanded and no one no one knows that. And why did it? Well, I talked to half of the people that were on that committee and they said, Kyle, we were just frustrated. We're frustrated because a lot of them are, are, are volunteers or, or current players, former players that came together and said, let me know how I can help. How can we grow this thing? How do we get to the Latino communities? I mean, some of these uh, the communities, especially Latino communities, I mean, obesity and other health issues, I mean, this is bigger than soccer. And they're trying to solve these problems, but, but, but it's not plugged into the federation. There is no execution. So, so they said, well, forget it. Let us know when someone comes in that's interested in doing these things. So um, there's a lot to do right away. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say right now that there's some switch that all of a sudden you have one new person and, and everything is going to be okay. The good part is there are many great people working at US Soccer. I mean, 150, 160 employees the infrastructure is there. There's a facade, but, but it hasn't been switched on because we haven't been delegating to these people. And we've been making unilateral decisions as, as a tiny group of two or three people, um, not qualified to make these decisions, but even if they were, no decisions should be made in tiny little groups like that. You need advisory boards, you need committees, you need task forces, but, but you have to say, we don't know in Chicago how to grow the game in South Carolina and in, and in Tennessee and in Indiana. So why are we sending PDIs out? Why are we sending mandates to, to states where they weren't even included in the decision process and in the design of these? And the birth chart's the, the, the highest profile example of splitting up best friends. Well, first off, sending the wrong birth chart, which was a bit embarrassing. But th there, there's so many examples of, we need a leader to come in and, and first and foremost say, don't have all the answers, not the expert in all categories, but boy am I lucky that there are so many great people in this game. And with a president that's going to lead, for sure, because you're gonna have to be unpopular with, with some crowd. I mean, you can't be liked by everyone. If you're liked by everyone, you're, you're definitely making a mistake. Um, but you have to be the one that goes in and surrounds yourself with smarter people. So I'm gonna hire these people right away. A technical director, uh, I've already sounded people out. I don't, I don't think it's appropriate to, to say who, but I, I've been reaching out to people who are interested in doing that. An advisory board, I, I have a lot of people I want to put on that. But again, um, I'm not going to make any of these decisions unilaterally. Uh, we need to create the type of federation where we're not so dependent on who our president is. Right now, it is a really important decision. Who our president is is absolutely vital. Uh, I mean, if we fail to get the World Cup in 2026, I mean, I tell you, th failing to qualify for the World Cup is not catastrophic. Something like that, with the impact that could have on the economy and the growth of this game, could be catastrophic. But the first thing I need to do is, is look behind the curtain. I mean, the reason it's a progress plan and not a business plan is the, the opacity of the organization and some of the, the, the deals, some of the partnerships, some of the affiliations make it so difficult from the outside to know exactly what needs to be done. But, 
But on the technical side, I mean, that's, that's what I do for a living. I, I'm paid to technically analyze Docker and as an owner of Mallorca, paid to execute when we make these observations to grow a soccer business. So when I get in there, I'm fortunate that Dan Flynn's gonna stay on as the CEO that runs the business. We keep, we keep getting sold this idea that, man, we need to make sure this president you know, went to the greatest business school and, and can run a Fortune 500 company. Do we need a, a business person with that acumen to be US soccer president? Absolutely, which is why I can demonstrate I have those qualities. But, but we have a business person as a CEO that runs, he's the one right now dealing with the consumer while everyone's out in the, in the public not calling Jonathan Guzman, um, Gonzalez and not, not dealing with, with issues that are day to day. I mean, Dan Flynn, when we failed to qualify for a World Cup, he went to work the next day and, and, and is running a business. So um, I need to get with him and I already have and we've had several conversations to understand what needs to be done. Part of that uh, transition to a new president is already in there. You, you have a, a process of obviously meeting all the staff, but getting brought up to speed on what's, what's been going on. Um, and then it's about, there's positions that need to be filled. There's decisions that need to be made. There's a World Cup bid that needs to be won. Um, and, and there is a youth structure that needs a leader that's going to, to finally come in to, uh, to make it a, a, a healthy way to grow membership and you know, cr create the type of federation where the crest actually means something to the player in the World Cup just as much as it means to the little kid that's uh, got an after school program. There was one question back here. Yeah. So, um, so, so, a, so a system that, that has a barrier to entry of cost, where did we talk about that? Um, we have one of the most expensive coaching courses in the world. Uh, the, the highest ratio of UEFA licensed coaches won't surprise anyone's in Spain. It won't surprise you that it's one of the most affordable coaching uh, courses to go through. Uh, e to F used, or um, sorry, E to A used to be a um, you know, six year process if you, if you really stuck to it and wanted to go all the way through. There, there, are, there are great suggestions and changes to some of the things being brought into the coaching uh, curriculum. None of it I, I, I've seen so far lowers the cost of it. Uh, none of it makes it more accessible. It, it makes it more expeditious, some of it. But, but a, a change to go to the modules of 4v4, 7v7, 9v9, 11v11 to align with the PDI and the change to the youth level. Um, my concern with some of this is uh, it, it's a bit redundant if you see some of the suggestions of this. You have people either online and then there's another course in person that might feel a bit of deja vu to say, I, I feel like I've taken this course already. Um, the, 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 the beauty of, I think, the, and it's perfect to talk about that, that here with an organization that is about coaching education instead of, instead of um, a applying for a license, um, that there is a worry as I speak to coaches that we're losing what is, is the most important part of, if you ask me some of the best coaches that I've had in my career, I'll tell you that they, they could connect with me as the individual. They understood me, they knew how to inspire me, and they, they, they knew what I needed to thrive in that environment. And a lot of, I feel like, the coaching that we're moving towards is much more about a group, and is much more about schemes and formations and, and I mean, these are kids that, that, that want to enjoy this game and, and we're turning it at a certain level. And someone said this to me the other day and I'm not gonna take it for my own, but he said, you know, Kyle, soon A-licensed coaches are gonna have to learn how to change diapers. I mean, we, 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 we are taking this very professional idea and that's why I had Thierry Henry come today to dispel this notion that this is how they do it abroad. Um, when you grow up in a country like Spain, everyone's a coach. I mean, your, your mom and dad are, are, are your first coaches. So education actually has to start with parents before your kid even gets into some of these systems. And we, we have ways we can do that, grassroots movements that are trying to do that. But, but the, the proposed changes, some of them are from great coaches from abroad that have never been to these states. So, so the challenges of how to coach in Southern California versus coach in Maine are totally different. 
So it's hard to really create one, one idea and one system if you're not going to, again, engage with the coaches that are doing such a good job at these levels. I also worry that some of the greatest coaches I ever had, now based on some of the barriers where getting past C or getting past B or getting past A, has certain, has certain requirements. Some of the best coaches I've ever had couldn't get an A license, you know, w wouldn't, have, wouldn't have continued up the path. So, so that concerns me a little bit, but, but, but it was the first part of your question. The thing that concerns me the most is the cost and, and, and the fact that it's hard to, to get in these courses. So we, you, you say the cost and people will say, well, here's how much it is for my kid to play soccer, or here's how much it is to get a coaching license. Um, and you said it, you forget to factor in, where is it? Oh, there's only, there's only two places where that's gonna happen. Oh, so I've, so I've gotta get a hotel and stay there for three or four days. I've gotta take off of work to do that if it cuts into the week. So we see why the, the numbers aren't great in, in, in certain ways that we go about this. So uh, there's a state association I talked to that has made coaching free, and they did it by getting rid of some of the leakish, leakage in terms of credit card companies they were using and other ways that it was adding to the cost of, of administrative uh, registration, and they, they got rid of all of that, and they added $3 to the membership for every kid, $3, and it made $150,000 for them, and they made coaching free in their state. So again, if we're listening to associations, they can tell us how to solve some of these problems. I mean, some of the associations, if you read through the PEI, the, the, the Player Development Initiative, they have been making some of these suggestions for a decade. For, for, for a decade, they were saying, we should do this, we should do this, we should do this, and finally a PDI comes out like, like they just thought of it, and, and, and associations are saying, thank you. We, we, we've been saying that for a long time. You know, some of, the, some of the associations are saying this about referee situations, you know, the SRA regionalization of, of assigners. Now, each state association is different, but I, mean, we, I, I can't stress it enough. We, we have to listen to the membership. And, and when it comes to coaching education, some of the best coaches in the world are at this convention this week. And we're going abroad to, to get coaches, to tell the coaches that we already have what they should be doing in communities that some of these people have never stepped into. So we, we have to really give credit to the coaches that we have here. And then of course, cherry pick great ideas from across the world. Uh, we are a multicultural country, it makes us beautiful. So of course go to Spain, go to, go to England, go to, to Argentina, I mean, go to these places and find out how they're doing these things. But we, but we have to understand we have, we have a paradigm here that's gonna take a long time to shift and we are very, very unique as a country. And when it comes to coaching education, we, we have come a long way, but we can do better and cost is the one area that we should focus on. I look at the surplus, the 150 million that we brag about as opportunity cost. You know, one way is to make that coaching uh, more affordable and make sure more parents that want to be involved, more players that, like myself, didn't think while they were playing, maybe that would be a great opportunity to stay in the game. There, there's so many ways to find referees and coaches within the pools that we're already operating in, but we just have to lower the cost and increase the accessibility. There's a question right here, and then there's a few in the back. Oh, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. You sure, want? I'll jump in. Okay. Kyle, Dan Pop, Washington Youth Soccer. Dan. Uh, as you know, and we've spoken about previously, there's a, there's a unique identifier in youth soccer across our country, and that is within each of our states, and in some states, a couple of entities, the state youth soccer associations are the only body that represent youth soccer in every single state, mm -hmm. right? We are the membership organizations to the federation. What's your vision? for how youth soccer associations across our 55 organizations uh, become part of the story for growth and getting new players, new kids to join the game? Really good question. And, and I honestly think the most important thing for whoever becomes president, um, we have to localize the game. We, we, we have to, we talked a lot about cost. Um, you, you, you shouldn't have to travel two, three, four hours um, to find competitive soccer. And um, the, the, the Clint Dempsey told me an amazing story about trying to do that. And I said, Clint, tell me, tell me the story. How did you become the player you became? And, and, and some of our story is similar. He played a lot of adult games when he was young. You know, I, I played a lot of indoor with the Latinos in Bridgeport and the Jamaicans in, in, in Mount Vernon. And that was part of my soccer education growing up. But I had, I had everything. 
right there. I, I, I had my high school soccer that was important to me, was part of my, pr my, my progression and my development. I had ODP was very important at that point. That was, that was my mechanism to be identified and grow as a player. And so we've slowly gotten away from the, 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 the association model of they were localizing the game. And, and instead of funding and fueling and integrating that and creating regionalized competition, uh, we, we, we've now turned into a, we can only identify players this way, and it's only in these tournaments, and now these, these players are flying all over, and, and that'd be one thing if we could really say that's the way it has to be done, but we can't. Clint Dempsey's story was that he went all the way to Dallas to try to play with the Texans. It was too expensive for him. His sister was a tennis player, and his parents had to make a tough decision. They said, Clint, right now we can't afford this, and he made the team. I mean, imagine telling that to your 13-year-old kid. You've made this team that, that is known in this area as one of the elite teams. We can't afford it right now. What did Clint do? He went back and played co-ed rec soccer as a 13-year-old and became one of the best players that we've ever produced. We have to remember that we can produce these players locally, and it solves so many problems. So uh, I know that some associations have a certain idea. You guys have a great idea about as, as a state, how you're going to help the Federation understand solving a problem where you have the country, a country the size of Europe. And, and, it, and it means give the associations the, the, the power and the authority to grow the game, create competition locally, create state cups, and bring, bring that pride and that, and that affinity of being in a local community back and then of course there's going to be, everyone's going to be a part of this. The, the, the discussion isn't mutually exclusive. It isn't, shouldn't, should we localize it and give associations the ability to create competition? Um, because the, there sometimes doesn't feel a reason for there to be a go-between because they're doing such great jobs growing the game at a local level. Now, we have other people who have come into the scenario and honestly, because of market confusion that I don't think that was by design, but basically the Federation created competitors in the same space. It's become difficult to understand how we all pull in the same direction. But we really should be able to see that there is a place for absolutely everyone. I mean, US youth, US clubs, say AYSO, everyone can be a part of helping to grow players. But if we don't localize things, then we don't double membership. Doubling membership sh should, should be the goal for, for the next you know, five to 10 year period. We, we have to say, if we haven't doubled the membership, 88 million kids between the age of two and 18, and we have four million playing, I, I'm sorry if, I, if, 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 if this is offensive, but that's not good enough. I mean, we keep using that as, as, as a, a metric to say, look at how much better we're doing than other sports, forgetting the fact that we lose so many kids. And the retention is because we've gotten away from, from letting associations tell us as a federation, we're your members, there's 55 of us. Some of us join, some of us not, but all of us trying to grow the game and understand what our membership wants locally. And listen to us, lead for sure. You need a leader right now, but you need a leader with the humility to say, I don't know in Washington what's, what's needed. Tell, tell me, and, and, and let's make sure that if you're doing it one way and that can work in another association, let's make sure that there is a central nervous system of information where we, we get back to where the game can be low cost, can be inclusive, and can be a great offer to the community to grow membership, and then everyone wins. Because you're gonna need everyone. If we, if we double membership, everyone's gonna be needed, and, and there are many different ways to make it up the pyramid, but we forget that 99% of the kids aren't gonna play professional soccer. So don't design a pyramid that is, that is exclusively focused on that, that vertical. I mean, we, we can do it locally, but we also can have a catch-all outside of the pyramid. Uh, uh, every other country, um, this is how they do it, right? Locally, that, that's where the authority is, where they, where they grow players, and then there's a, 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 a funnel up to a professional team that eventually takes over. We, we don't have that based on certain challenges in this country, um, but, but what, we, what we do have and what can be possible is a country this size can, can regionalize the effort, and they're not gonna pull it off from Chicago with, a, with 150 staff and $150 million surplus. And if, if we, at this, at this point, admit 
okay, maybe, maybe we've got this one wrong. I, I, I honestly believe the way to win World Cups is to return to the grassroots level, make the game fun again, and ask the associations, what, what do you need from us? As opposed to, here's what you're gonna be doing locally. Um, you know, and, and then at that point, well, let's debate it. I mean, that, that hasn't worked. That, that, that's not working, and, and, and participation's down 25% from last year. Um, we need to wake up now, and um, I've enjoyed our conversations because you've helped me see what you think is gonna work in Washington, and now what we need to see is how many associations will that work for? And if it doesn't work for them, we'll figure out what will work for them, but, but we, 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 can't, we can't encroach upon and climb down the pyramid into an area where we're not the experts in. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. There was one right here, and then, then back there, and then I got a, I've got five minutes, and Terry and I went over by a half an hour, so if I do that again, I'm definitely gonna lose voters. <laughs> I just got a quick question to kind of piggyback off the education part. Where do you see United Soccer coaches fitting in with USSF as far as being an equivalent like it used to be? I've got a lot of coaching friends that have gone that route. I've mm -hmm. been lucky enough to go both routes. Yeah. But some of these guys are in like panic mode right now. Because mm -hmm. they have what, a 30, 30,000 coaches? I mean, does anyone know the, it's a big, big number of coaches that have yeah. come through the, the United Coaches program. And, and what I worry about is there's overlap, of course, because it's, it, the, the authors have been the same. I mean, some of the things that have been written in both categories um, th there, there is there is some similarities, but I I, I worry about the, the the suggestions for U.S. soccer license um, in ways I don't worry about United Coaches, where United Coaches feels like education to me, and and, and I'm worried that the, the the model we're using and 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 leaning towards and heading towards with the federation is is, is one that. Um, is not instilling the qualities that make a really, really great coach. Um, you know, some of it at the higher up level is excellent. And I just had some friends that went through the pro license uh, and the A license and, and, and were very complimentary of what was going on there. But, but at the entry level, at the development level, I mean, coaching education, I, I wouldn't be a good coach. Uh, it, it is such a difficult job. It is the most important part of this entire pyramid, the educators. Right, and so we have to make a coaching license about education, and I, and I, 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 I want to know that um, there is no barrier to entry. If you want to get an education, and United Coaches, and I spoke with Lynn Burling Manuel, and and you know Joe Cummings, and others that have been a part of this organization, they feel strong that, and, and I do too. They have an abs absolutely an integral part to play in getting our coaches ready to be with our kids in the most important time in their lives to make them fall in love with this game, stay in love with this game, and as Thierry said this morning, make them smarter. Um, I, I, I wanna believe that there's more collaboration that's possible. And, and it goes to the youth part of the game, it goes to everything. I mean, there, there is more collaboration possible. We have to stop as a federation becoming a competitor. We, we, keep, we keep, whether it's with fans, whether it's with refs, whether it's with coaches, whether it's with players, we, ke we keep making decisions that, that that climb into the marketplace and, and become competition and make it harder for associations to uh, make uh, their, their coaching affordable because a lot of it's reinvested back. When they, when they make a profit off their coaching, a lot of it's reinvested back in having instructors, instructors and getting fields. And so United Coaches is a way to get a great soccer education and maybe to avoid some of the barriers that, that are going to exist if we don't tweak and understand what the current changes are to the Federation coaching license, um, because I, I'm just worried that some of the best coaches I, I ever had um, are, are only going to, to, to grow and learn in an area that does not give them accreditation to, to be able to get into the system, to be around the kids that need to be exposed to that sort of level of coaching. And, um, you know, I mean, that, that's an important thing to make sure that United Coaches and, and U.S. Soccer Federation are, are working, so, I mean, it has to be a symbiotic relationship to make sure that uh, affordability, as the question was before, and also assessment. You know, some of the, some of the changes to the Federation program um, is a binary green light, red light, and it kind of is starting to feel like just fill this out for, for, for a license, 
Um, and and I, I looked at the 20, you know, or to the 200 point assessment and, and the things that were there before with the ENF and thought to myself, I'm not sure what this is fixing. Um, so some of this is I, I need to sit down with some of these organizations and I haven't gotten the time to sit with the, the authors of the new plan, Vim and Alois and, and, and those guys. And I've been fortunate while I've been here to be able to sit down with the United Coaches and understand that they, they, do, they do believe that they're the educators. And um, I think that's always gonna have a role to play, but I wanna make sure that like you get a driver's license when you're a coach, uh, you, know, you, 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 can, you can be a coach anywhere. Does that, does that answer your question? All right, so I'll take one more question and then they're gonna kick me off the stage. Yeah, that, that one's really easy. Um, solidarity payments are possible. Uh, I, I think that Crossfire and, and, and over a dozen other cases are, are going to be ruled in favor of these clubs. There, there's no real, I haven't seen a legitimate reason not to do what they do around the world. Um, and child, child labor laws and other things have been cited. But um, if, if we, and this was the question Dan posed, first we have to start by there has to be an actual definition of what, what the pyramid looks like. And then the way that we make the local game work and, and we reward Washington or, or Tennessee or Connecticut for developing players locally and, and being okay with, you know what, there's a higher level and, and here it is, here's the coach, I called them, I think you're ready for that. Uh, and, and the Federation says, we, we have milestones that if you hit, thank you. And so we have a player that we develop in Mallorca, Asensio, who's playing for Real Madrid. Uh, when he scores a goal, I, I get really happy because he's gonna be sold pretty soon. And you know what's gonna happen? We're gonna build a facility with that money. And, and that facility is going to train more kids and hopefully one Asensio comes out of that and we do it and we do it over again and over again and it compounds. This is how it's done around the world. So solidarity payments, training reimbursements, grants, um, the Federation can do this, but you know what we can do as well? is we, we can start by, before we even get there, taking some of our surplus, our strategic partners and saying, you've been doing it already. Let's kind of start with a good faith donation to the projects that you have going on. Let's lower the insurance costs for the adults. Let's build fields for, for the youth. Let's lower the cost of a coaching license. Let's start with that good faith as a sort of, we're a federation that, that is here for the members again. You know, there's other amazing mechanisms and, and over, over under is a, a low cost, high impact one to get fields in inner cities, but there's a defense budget for every state and there's recreation that's earmarked for a big chunk of money for each state where we could go in as a federation and, and, and with our, our importance in the community to if we're truly talking about health and wellness at these ages, we can create dollar for dollar shares to say, can we get some federal funding and Ed Foster Simeon's doing a great job of this with the US Soccer Foundation, but we should be doing it as well with the Federation. Uh, you know, for, for every dollar of funding we can get for these programs, the Federation's gonna put a dollar in from our surplus. I mean, before we even get to solidarity payments, we should, we should, we have back, we have back pay that we owe. And so um, that's an easy one. And, and that's something that has to happen right away. So thank you, that's, that's a really good question. Um, let me just, let me just close it up and thank you guys again for, for coming here today. Um, thank you to uh, my, my friends and my coaches from my youth level being here, supporting me and helping me through this process to, to meet others who are doing what they're doing in their states. Thank you to associations who I've sat down with to educate me and help me understand what's going on in your state and the great things that you're doing. But, but thanks to everyone for, for, for caring this much. Um, I, I know it feels, um, it feels with some of the narrative that gets pushed, it, 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 it feels we're, we're, we're at this low point. You know, th this inflection point sometimes feels a bit, a bit hopeless and, and, and self-deprecating and you know, we're just not good enough. I, I just wanna make it clear that um, we have amazing people in this game. We have grown it so much and we have this incredible opportunity. Once you get over the heartache and, and, and once you clear through the noise, um, you realize that something really great's possible. And, and right now with the right leadership, leadership with the ability to bring everyone to the table 
and, and do so not for them, and do so not, not because of ego, not, not because of position, but do so because the thing that got us in these seats, the thing that brought us through all this bad weather to come here, it's, it's just a love for this game. So um, thank you for loving the game as much as I do. Thank you for creating a, a soccer culture that I grew up in. Thank you for giving me the opportunity I have to stand up here right now because it wouldn't be without a few people sitting there and it wouldn't be without all the people in this room that have done so much to grow this game. So thank you very much.